And now, please welcome to the stage the director of DARPA's Biological Technologies Office, Dr. Justin Sanchez. Imagine if we could detect any threat, anytime, anywhere. Imagine if we also knew what that threat was, we could deliver instantaneous, scalable protection to millions of people across the globe. And then imagine that if we could do that, we could also scale warfighter performance and readiness. How might we do all of this? Biology, the study of life. Its inception as a science dates back to ancient times where scholars like Aristotle and Avicenna questioned the very essence of life itself. For them, biology had almost magical properties. Organisms persisted despite great changes in food and water and temperature. Far from understanding these organisms and all of their complexity, these scientists could devote entire careers and lifetimes to just observing biology and categorizing it. So while these observations of biology provide a report of the structure, they fall short of giving one the ability to understand function and take action to produce a desired response. Take, for example, the heart. We can study the heart in all of its full uh, magnificence. We can study every muscle fiber, every nerve that innervates that muscle fiber, the valves opening and closing, how all of the pieces ultimately fit together. But those observations alone do not give us the ability to fix an irregular heartbeat with a cardiac pacemaker. It's only when biology and engineering came together did we have bioengineering, and that gives us the ability to design, construct, and forecast the function of biological systems. So today, while you may think of biology as that class from high school where you had to memorize a bunch of different parts of plants and animals, I'm here to share with you a very different story. Biology and biological technologies are very real technologies, and they shape many aspects of, of your world. Many people don't give a second thought to biology because it operates so naturally and it's so readily available. Take, for example, that vaccine you took as a child to prevent polio. It has its roots in the development of that vaccine of biotechnology, it prevented us from living our lives in iron lungs. That cereal that you ate for breakfast this morning, the corn in it, has a, its roots in a biological technology, scaled production of corn. And even that audio file that you listen to on your smartphone also has its roots in biological technology, psychoacoustics. This is what enables us to put thousands and thousands of songs on that smartphone without you perceiving an audible difference in the sound quality. So, while many of you may think about DARPA as these large, powerful technologies like that rocket there that are in the hands of only a few people in the globe, when it comes to biological technologies, the situation is drastically different. They are in the hands of the many. So take, for example, the iGEM competition. This is the International Genetically Engineered Machines competition. Every year, hundreds of people come together. These are students. They come together from all across the globe, and you can see the countries that they come from, and they use gene editing technologies to actually modify single-cell organisms. Again, it's amazing. There's no limit to the creativity of these people and even people across the globe using small, pervasive, persistent, powerful technologies for good or for ill, again, across the globe. So, to lead the global frontier of biological technologies, a new way of thinking is needed to stay ahead of technological surprise. A new way of thinking is needed to lead the development of biological technologies capabilities, and a new way of thinking is needed to shepherd investment in biological technologies. So today, I'm gonna to take you on a journey, and I'm gonna share with you DARPA's way of thinking about biological technology to defend the homeland. All right, so as you can see from this picture of New York City, defending the homeland refers to a lot of different things. Let me just share with you a few of them. Take, for example, the water. 
This could be our adversaries putting manned or unmanned vehicles close to our shores. Or it could be global travel hubs, how natural or engineered pathogens could make their way through those travel hubs and affect millions of people. Or it could even be our food, right? It could be a directed attack on our food supply. What can we do about this? How can biological technologies ultimately play a role? Well, uh, biology has these unique properties. It's adaptable, it's autonomous, it's persistent. And this may look like a cute picture of a butterfly here, but I see an amazing organism. And that organism was once a caterpillar. So we're leveraging these attributes of biology to create unique and powerful technologies. Now, when BTO was formed, April 1st, 2014, the focus was on three foundational scientific areas, neurotechnology, synthetic biology, and outpacing infectious diseases. But now four years later, we have a very different perspective. We're leveraging not only those foundations, but others, and we're trying to put them together into real capabilities that can help us to create a more, uh, more prepared and resilient DOD and solve some of the world's most challenging problems. So let's go back to those kind of three questions that I posed at the beginning of this. Imagine a world that we could in real time detect and characterize any threat posed by an adversary anywhere in the world. Again, it sounds impossible, but with biological technologies, we think we can do it. So first, let's consider that we wanted to surveil the maritime environment, trying to find if this manned or unmanned vehicle is in a place where, where we need to know about it, okay? Now, most of us in the room may say, oh, just engineer a system to do that, but in BTO, we have a very different idea. We ask the question, can we enlist marine organisms to help us out? All right, so a lot of you may not know about this, but submariners find the background noise of shrimp to be a nuisance when they're trying to listen to their sonar. You have snapping shrimp that, that make sounds when there are vehicles that are passing by. So for them, while that sounds like a problem, BTO, that's a solution to us. We're gonna turn this into an advantage and maybe explore the possibility of using these kinds of signals in order to garner the signal of interest. We're already on our way to do this. We have a program manager in our office that is already making progress. So that's the maritime environment. What about on the land? So we're thinking about of enlisting plants to act as biosensors. We're developing advanced plant technologies to engineer plants that can help us to de detect a, a variety of signals. So let's say we wanted to detect an explosive. We could engineer that plant to be sensitive to the compound of the explosive, and then it could provide a signal that could be detected at standoff by military personnel or first responders, okay? So again, we're already making progress in doing this in a radically different way of thinking about biological technologies and how we would ultimately defend the homeland. So again, let's imagine that if we could detect that threat, what if we could de deliver scalable protection and countermeasures to millions of people? Now, there's one reality that we're all living with, okay? Not a day goes by that we read in our news feeds a new story about an infectious disease. It could be this year's influenza, so we're on the cusp of getting into flu season, or even the flare-up of Ebola that's happening in Africa right now, okay? So again, these are very real threats that we need new solutions. Okay, now there's one issue though that you need to know about. So traditional vaccines can take months, if not years, in order to develop. And moreover, even if you get the vaccine right, once you get that vaccine, it can take up to two weeks for it to ultimately become effective. So this approach is not gonna work when an unknown virus emerges. We can't hit the pause button and get more time. Pandemics are not gonna wait for us, okay? So we need a radically different approach. So in BTO, we're pioneering that radically different approach. And uh, we want to confer near instantaneous protection by doing it a different way. We want to use the body as a bioreactor. But that bioreactor is going to run off the blueprint for producing the antibodies, OK? And the, the blueprint is given by the genetic code. So again, this may sound very different and, and challenging. Let me share with you how it ultimately works. So we can develop that code for the antibodies you need as DNA. You can get an injection in, let's say, the muscle of your, of your shoulder. That, again, that DNA goes into the muscle of your shoulder, it gets incorporated into those cells, and then those cells will know instantaneously or near instantaneously what antibodies they need to produce in order to uh, combat that pathogen, okay? So we're not just stopping there. We're also trying to develop a pandemic platform to take pandemics off the table. 
So when the next outbreak emerges, we get those patient samples to a biotech integrator. That biotech integrator uh, can grow enough virus, can find the right antibodies you need, can evolve those antibodies, and can ultimately help us to produce 20,000 doses in 60 days or less. That is a very real milestone of the program that we are working on to actually deliver this. And once we have those 20,000 doses, we're trying to get them out to the people that need it the most, okay? Now let's, let's talk for a minute about those people. The people that are called upon to deal with some of these issues are military personnel. Day in and day out, these brave women and men have to operate in life-threatening situations. We must help, help them to prepare for and recover from a variety of missions that they face. So let's imagine another world. Imagine a world where we could revolutionize warfighter readiness and resilience, okay? So for most of you in the room, when you may think about warfighter readiness and resilience, you may think of going to the gym, lifting some more weights, maybe running a few more miles. But in BTO, we think of something radically different, okay? You may have never thought about this, but microbes play a role in a wide variety of, of our uh, body functions. The microbiome, okay, is a diverse set of microorganisms. They live in us and on us, and they're on every surface of every part of this room, okay? And we can think about what functionality do those microorganisms ultimately give us, and how can they play a role in warfighter readiness and resilience? So perhaps the microbes that live in your lungs or in your nasal passageways could protect you against a chem or bio threat. Maybe the microbes that work between our end organs and our nervous system can help us with decision making. And maybe even the microbes that we share amongst each other could help in our teaming. So again, while we're out there shaking hands, we're sharing microbes and they play a role in all of this, okay? So these non-invasive, non-permanent kinds of technologies could provide soldiers a whole new way of thinking about readiness and resilience and protect them from a wide variety of threats and promote their health, okay? So that's readiness and resilience. What about the next step? So what if beyond readiness and resilience, we could accelerate warfighter performance and recovery? Now, in BTO, when we hear those words, performance and recovery, we know that the brain is a part of everything that military personnel uh, do. Okay, so over the years in uh, DARPA BTO, we have been working on a technology called neurotechnology. Okay, these are direct interfaces to the brain. And these types of technologies work like this, okay? And it's a little video of one of our prototype devices. You sense neural signals from multiple locations of the brain. They can get aggregated into this little hub, transmitted down into your chest where there's a computer that interprets those signals and sends signals either directly back to the brain or to a variety of devices that may be out in the external uh, environment, okay? Now, over the years, we've made good on our promise to help restore movement and sensation to our wounded warriors using neurotechnology, okay? And there's one very special person in the room here, Fred Downs, he's sitting in, in the front row. He is a Vietnam veteran who's using one of our bits of neurotechnology. He has uh, the world's most advanced commercially available prosthetic arm. It was developed under one of our programs. Now, it's not only helping Fred get back to his more normal self, but it's also a point to illustrate at DARPA, we can go from concept to a prototype to FDA clearance to a startup company to prescription by the Veteran, Veterans Administration in only a handful of years, okay? Again, true testament to what DARPA BTO can do. Now there's also another special person in the room. Uh, her name is Jan Sherman. She's uh, shown on the right side of the screen. She's living with paralysis from the neck down. She also has one of these direct neural interfaces and she did something quite remarkable with her uh, neural interface. She was able to control two prosthetic arms just using one hemisphere of her brain. So let me play a little video for, uh, for you to see uh, what Jan can ultimately do. All right, so that's kind of in the medical domain, but what's over the horizon in terms of performance? So as of today, we've taken another step forward. Using a direct neural interface, signals from the brain can be used to, and, and interpreted to command and control a virtual aircraft. And not just one aircraft, three simultaneous kinds of aircraft. And moreover, the signals from those aircraft, the sensors from those aircraft can be delivered directly back to the brain so that the user or the operator can also perceive the environment. 
Now, uh, all of this may, may seem very challenging. Again, it's, it's taken a number of years to try to figure this out, but I'd like to also share with you another pioneer that has helped us to try to figure out the technology associated with this. So uh, his name is Nathan. He's actually gonna be down in the exhibit hall a little later today. He's also living with a direct neural interface. That direct neural interface was mapped onto an aircraft, and this is what Nathan can ultimately do. Okay? He was able to fly a virtual F-35 over virtual Las Vegas. We're remapping his neural signals onto the control surfaces of that aircraft, and he's able to command and control it in a very natural and easy way. And he actually did a little barrel roll uh, right at the end there. So Nathan was having uh, uh, some fun with his neural interface. Okay? So while we think about military personnel right, and, and the missions uh, that they face, we also have to think about military personnel when they come back home, okay? Men and women all across our great country make extraordinary sacrifices to defend our homeland. And uh, oftentimes, they not only bear the scars on the outside, but they bear the scars uh, of those sacrifices on the inside. Uh, more than 2.2 million American veterans are living with some form of neuropsychiatric illness, and those are just the ones that we know about, okay? And for many of them, medications don't work. Laying out on the couch and, and getting some, some therapy from, from your uh, physician doesn't always work. We need something better, okay? So I'm gonna share with you today another pioneer in our neurotechnology. She's living with a neuropsychiatric condition, okay? And, and, and let me just kind of frame this before I show you the video, all right? So she's living with a condition called epilepsy, but she also has another uh, comorbidity, extreme anxiety. Okay, so she has this debilitating anxiety, and she's coming to the neurosurgery clinic in order to have surgery for her epilepsy. But while she's in the clinic, we can also test some of our neurotechnology. So she has a direct interface to multiple structures of her brain. The signals are coming out in real time. We're interpreting those signals, and the physician is able to, to guide the kind of therapy that is given directly back to the brain. Okay? So I'm gonna show you two videos, one with the neurotechnology turned off, and one with the neurotechnology turned on, and this is what her experience is. It tends to just go down, mm -hmm. downhill very quickly, and I get such bad anxiety from nothing all of a sudden. Before you said you were calm, are you still feeling calm? More excitement, maybe. There we go. It's good. Okay. Is that, Look at that. Do you think that, uh, do you know why you're feeling that difference? No. I don't actually. My goodness, all of a sudden, I'm like, I have some energy. But I like energy. Okay. So that feels good? It really does. Okay. Wow. What, what did you ladies do? This is excellent news. Do you, does this kind of excitement that you're feeling, is it something that you feel on a good day or something yeah. that you never feel? Oh, good days. Okay. Oh, yeah. There are so many things I just love. Love to do things. Okay. When I'm not having... See, this is normal. Like, I love excitement. All right, so let's take a moment to kind of let this soak in, all right? The people that we love that may be living with neuropsychiatric illness, they could be military personnel or not, we have new options for them moving forward. This, you know, what this truly means is that they don't have to live with extreme depression, debilitating depression, or extreme anxiety, or extreme PTSD. Now we have some new choices, and we're gonna try to make these technologies go from this proof of concept all the way to commercial products that can ultimately impact their life, okay? So without a doubt, uh, these powerful technologies that I've shown you today have a lot of implications. Now we think about them in the context of national security, but with all powerful technologies, they will raise a variety of social issues that we'll have to address. So will society consider some form of neural enhancement a personal choice, just like we have laser eye surgery or braces? Uh, could there be a disturb disturbing gap between those who have biotechnology and those who don't have biotechnology? And how does access to therapeutics for, let's say, Ebola affect those living in different parts of the globe? It's our job and it's our mission to think over the horizon and imagine this future, but the answers to the questions are not just for the technologists. They're for all of us, okay? It's a very important point. And we can't go at this alone. 
we must come together and all think over the horizon. Remember, biological technologies are completely democratized. So how the story unfolds to defend the homeland ultimately depends upon all of you, okay? The people in the front of the room, the people in the back of the room, it's all of us, we have a role in this. So again, we need to come together and think about what that means. And let me just share with you a few touch points. It's the Department of Defense. It's how we work across the interagency. So Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, BARDA, there's any number of federal agencies uh, that we can work with to try to get these technologies out into the real world so that we can defend the homeland. It's how we work with industry. How do we build an industrial base in biotechnology? And that could be for national security or that can be even in the commercial world. It's how we work with academia, the cradle of ideas. At the end of the day, it truly is the partnerships that we form right here, right now for biotechnology in the future. So when we began this journey together, you may have asked yourself the question, how could biological technologies possibly improve our national security to defend our homeland? But when we work together, the better question is, what can't biological technologies do to improve our world? With the seeds that we're planting today, we are opening the possibility that we could live in a world where we don't have to worry about an adversary biological threat. We could live in a world where we truly take pandemics off the table. We could live in a world where the brain becomes a new tool to handle complexity. All of this, all that I've shown you here today, our commitment, unwavering commitment to national security, our vision of the future, it's our partnerships. This entire vision together is the future we call BioNext. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'd like to take you to the next part of the BioNext session. We're gonna bring up um, a number of people that have firsthand experience for a lot of the topics that I shared with you here today. So first up, we have Nahid Bedelia. She just got back from Africa and is a frontline Ebola doctor. Next up, we have Ed Yu, who is from the FBI, and uh, he is working on uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, countermeasures for that, and thinking about the bioeconomy. Uh, after Ed, we have uh, Neil Hermanson. He's a, a Navy SEAL, a, a early adopter of a lot of biotechnologies. And last but not least, we have Richard Danzig, who was a former Secretary of the Navy. So thank you so much to you all for, for joining us. And um, yeah, give a round of applause for our, our group. So our, our goal here for today, again, I, I shared with you a, a vision of what, what the future looks like, but I really wanted to bring uh, this panel here so that they can, again, share with you their firsthand experience of what they're dealing with. And, uh, you know, this is meant to be an informal conversation, uh, so again, they, they can kind of uh, tell you what they've been through. So first up in our list is Nahid. You just got back from uh, Africa. Uh, what did you experience there? Um, so... Thank you, Justin. Uh, first, I want to thank DARPA for having me. And as you mentioned, I'm an infectious diseases physician. And in my day job, I actually run a medical response program for a maximum containment laboratory. Um, so I've been over the last seven or eight years, I've been working on how do we make our communities and our researchers safe against highly communicable diseases, which is how I got pulled into Ebola response in the first place in 2014. So I found myself, if I can get this to work, um, in Kenema, Sierra Leone, in two, the August of 2014, and then went back for about three more trips after that, taking care of Ebola patients. And I have to tell you, people will talk about how dire the situation was in West Africa, um, but until you've actually had someone tell you how bad things were, you won't realize why the mortality is 60, 70, 80 percent. Um, just to give you an idea, when I first got to Kenema in August 2014, what I discovered was there were four of us physicians and about eight nurses and over 100 patients at any one time in a space that was contained for about 40 people. Um, and just to give you an idea of how bad that is, Emory had the opposite ratio of providers and patients, right? Um, and then to make it worse, I think what most people don't realize is that Ebola patients are like cholera patients. They lose a lot of body fluid, and to replace that, you need to give them intravenous resuscitation. But all you had while you were there is this kind of protective equipment. So Ebola is all around you. I, I, I can't even imagine what that was like. It, it just... 
I, I think that when you do anything for the first time, and of course, you know, we were supposed to be experts ready to take care of patients uh, from who were researchers potentially, um, but when you do this for the first time, you realize how different it is, and then add to that this idea that you're doing it in, a, in clearly an unsafe situation. Um, so here it is, there are patients that, you know, you need to give a lot of intravenous fluid to. Um, from the Emory experience, we know that that's about, um, 10 to 12 liters that they need to get. Now imagine four to eight of us per shift in there, 100 something patients, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to give them about 10 to 12 liters. If you're, any of you are clinicians, you know what that means is you gotta be at the bedside, beginning of the hour, end of the hour, 10 times. I can tell you we only gave fluids to about 30, 40% of the people and maybe one or two liters. And that's why the mortality is 60, 70, 80%. It's not just a function of the disease. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I technology to make that faster, not have to give as much fluids and all well, of that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. So you should know, and people should know that the Ebola care for patients hasn't changed since 1976. So I had the opportunity to go back and actually look at the initial reports from 1976 and 79 in Sudan and Bundabugio. And if I'm being honest with you and myself, the care I provided in West Africa was actually probably worse than what they received in 1976 because the environment was so much more dire. Um, and so there are things that I think we can do to improve both patient quality of care as well as equity in kind of care we provide. And I'll make the argument that by doing that, we're keeping ourselves safer because the quicker you get people into care, the more you can sort of, you know, uh, more quickly you can stop an outbreak, the safer it is for the whole world. An outbreak anywhere is an outbreak, you know, everywhere. Um, the, the trouble is there are certain things that we have to take the long road on, right? You talked about detecting healthcare or threats anywhere at any time. At the terminal end of all international surveillance are communities that don't have access to care, right? And oh. so until we fix that, that's always gonna be an issue. But there are definitely places where technological innovation can actually really help us make a dent, right? And so what I wanna do today is to draw the distinction between what those areas are. So first and foremost, help me get my patients into care faster. What we know is that the quicker you bring somebody into care for Ebola, the better chances of survival they have. So there are a few ways to do this. The DRC outbreak right now, what we know is that it's complicated by the fact that it's geographically remote areas and then you can't get access to care to patients because of conflict. If we have technologies that allow us to get to geographically you know, remote areas or to bring care to them or to bring patients over, transportation, communication, all of those things may seem like small potatoes, but they can really help us control the outbreak better. The second is help us figure out who, when someone is exposed, who is actually going to develop the disease before they develop the symptoms. Once somebody develops the symptoms, they're allowed, able to sort of transmit it to other people. There already, there's already research that actually is able to pick up host markers that can tell us. We're funding some of that. The I know you are. <laughs> program, if you're curious on that one. So, um, so the elements like that can help us bring people into care earlier. That improves, improves their quality of care, but also saves us all and protects us all from further infections. The third is, help, help me figure out when someone is sick, who is gonna have a tough course of disease and who's gonna have a light one? Because there is a difference. Some people actually have very light disease courses and what the difference is and how we can learn from that. And that takes actually investment in research capacity in a lot of these areas. Um, then there's like more easier, simple things, right? Justin mentioned that these are the kind of personal protective equipments that we wore. PPE hasn't changed in decades, right? We could spend an hour and a half and maybe two hours in PPE. Now imagine eight of us, right? 100 patients, only an hour and a half or two hours at a time. That's, that's the reason why the mortality is so high. So um, if, you, if we make better personal protective equipment, healthcare workers can spend more time at the bedside and we can provide better care and have better outcomes. Give us stuff to monitor our patients with more continuously so we can learn about the disease itself, the process, um, and learn where there's opportunity to intervene earlier to really save these patients. Yeah. Um, the other aspects that I think you should know about are, so I talked about the fact that the infection control was pretty rudimentary in that area, right? 100 something patients. The way that Ebola treatment units are designed is someone comes into you, uh, into the, into you, and you admit them because they fit a ca clinical case definition, right? The ETUs are divided into suspect wards and confirmed wards. We bring you in because you have nausea, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, and we wait until you've confirmed your test to put you in the confirmed ward. Just hang in, hang in there with me. There's a point to this. 
what else looks like fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea in West Africa? Everything. <laughs> Everything looks like that, okay? So if you had the bad luck of having malaria and you were brought into the suspect ward, in West Africa during the worst months of that epidemic, you had to wait two to three days to get your result. You talked about me being in the scenario with personal protective equipment on. Imagine patients who are in there without anything on for two or three days. So rapid diagnostics that allow us to pick up the disease that I think we have made some headway into, but also disease, uh, rapid diagnostics that help us sort of really figure out the differential di diagnosis, other diseases it might be. It doesn't help you if you save them from Ebola and you're like, oh, you don't have Ebola, but goodbye. You know, you have typhoid, but we don't know that. Um, so really helping us sort of figure out what else it could be is helpful. Um, and then the last element of this is, I think one that I personally was very much affected by. We need to have a better idea um, and better sort of technologies to help us maintain the personhood of a person with Ebola. So what do I mean by that? So I was just telling um, Richard and Ed when we were walking in, um, the, we discovered in this last big epidemic that there is such a thing as post-Ebola virus disease syndrome, okay? People who survive Ebola then go on to have chronic symptoms for a very long period of time. So this photo that you see here is from a training of survivors. The, they wanted to go back and work in Ebola treatment units, and so we gave them a lot of IPC infection control training just to make sure that they remain safe. Already, more than 60% of people in this picture were, or had symptoms of post-Ebola virus disease. And the world didn't really know about that entity until the last epidemic. And there was this conversation about, is this something new that Ebola does? And guess what? We went back and we talked to a lot of outbreak survivors from prior outbreaks, and they all have these kind of symptoms. So how do we not know? So here's the tough part. The reason we don't know the full scope of disease presentations for a lot of these emerging diseases is because we don't stick around after outbreaks. So providing some sort of longitudinal care can actually really help us by learning more about the disease. But there are more immediate technological innovations that we could do to help this, right? So a lot of, there's a, if you're an Ebola patient, they burn all your personal protective, I'm sorry, personal property because they're trying to protect the rest of the community from not getting the infection. So if you're a patient, you're gonna take all your valuables with you and you bring it to the Ebola treatment unit but nothing that goes into the Ebola treatment unit comes out of it, right? That's why we couldn't get any data out. By the way, another place for innovation, quicker, easier ways of getting patient data out of, of ETUs. So people lost their land deeds, their certificates of graduation, they lost their national ID card. There's a gentleman who came up to me and said, thank you for giving me a training stipend, but I can't invest it in a bank because I can't open an account, so I can't save for my children. So you can sort of see, the drastic difference, because if the epidemic happened here, how many of you do you think would lose our iPhone Xs before somebody came up with a solution, right? The idea that it's so okay for some people to lose so much because it's happening somewhere else, I think it's, it's, it's I would challenge that at its basis. So um, I'll, I'll stop there and, and just say one more thing, aside from all the stuff that I've already mentioned, you've talked about the vaccines and medical countermeasures, and clearly we need that. We need vaccines and medical countermeasures to be developed more quickly, but an important part of this is we need uh, for them to be heat stable and be able to be stored without much of a cold, um, cold chain, right? If we can do that, we can get those things out. Um, as, as safely as possible and as effectively as possible in areas that are needed. That may be one place where there's other federal agencies that are working on some of those things. We can bring those capabilities together. Again, that's that interagency to develop an end-to-end -end kind of uh, therapy. Definitely. It's a really tough problem. Yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, Ed, over to you. So that was the front lines. Now we're thinking about law enforcement, right? right. So, so tell me uh, your perspective from the FBI when it comes to WMD. Sure, so first I wanna thank you. It's an honor and privilege to be participating in, in DARPA 60 like this, and it's, it's actually befitting. Uh, so I'm part of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate in the Biological Countermeasures Unit. So our role is to identify current and emerging biological threat issues. Um, so having said that though, if you notice that a lot of the discussions when it comes to bio, is the focus t tends to go towards the dangerous pathogens or toxins. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to downplay that, it's still incredibly important, but biotechnology is taking a bigger us picture. More, it's right? a much bigger issue yeah. now. And one of the best ways of, of characterizing that is an individual said that the 19th century was the Industrial Revolution, the 20th century you know, was personal computing and information age and revolution, and because of biotech, the 21st century is going to be the revolution of the life sciences. 
And some of the things about that's happening is that, well, one, incredible capability, vast dissemination. So you have universities and companies and even garage biohackers and college students, you mentioned iGEM, that are actually developing and, and innovating in this space. But it does pose an interesting challenge, though, that, for example, it's more than just your, uh, the, the pathogens, but now we're talking about health, because that's one of the most direct applications and the most incentives. A little bit of history, the first time the entire uh, genetic code of a human being was, was uh, deciphered was the Human Genome Project in 2003. That took 10 years and three and a half billion dollars to sequence one person's entire genetic code, the DNA. Today, you can do it in less than 24 hours, and the going rate is about 600 bucks. And I pretty much, uh, I'm sure that we're gonna break the sub $100 mark within the next year or so. So what that means is that we're generating massive amounts of genetic information. And, but then your genetic information is just one element of it, because your DNA doesn't change much over time. But then you need other things, so like your lifestyle, your medical history, and suddenly this becomes a very powerful health tool. Why? You download apps that track how much sleep are you getting, how much exercise are you getting, what's your caloric intake. So it's how do you aggregate all this to come up with very specific, tailored, customized therapies and treatments for diseases. So what you're saying is if we know the genetic code and we know behavior, right, or somebody knows th that this is kind of the whole picture, right? Of Correct. How a person is characterized. Right. And then this, there's another other element of this, too, is where high-performance computing comes into play. Yeah. Because you may know everything about who I am, my family history, my medical history, but then it in of itself doesn't mean much. Now you have to, the, 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 the magic happens when you compare myself to a population scale data set. And, and who's working on these kind of things? Is this an industry? Is this academics? Is this? Everybody. And this was really uh, launched with, uh, the, the, under the Obama administration with the Precision Health Initiative. Mm -hmm. So this was an initiative to launch and invested in initially $215 million from the US government that has since been augmented with the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act that added another $1.3 billion to leverage artificial intelligence, machine learning, and aggregate all these different data sources to come up with precision health. Yeah. So that's the US, but what about abroad? <laughs> are, are there other countries that are also interested in, in this kind of work? Absolutely, because there's a lot to be gained here. And hence, this is where biosecurity or biological threats absolutely needs to go beyond just pathogens because now suddenly your health, your biological data has incredible value. And I'm afraid that the bad guys know it too. So just for an example, you'll know, you recall that over the last few years there have been some significant cyber intrusions in the health insurance industry. Um, you know, the Anthem Blue Cross, Primera and everything, which impacted tens of millions of US persons. But what was the immediate concern? The potential for identity theft, the potential for fraud. But if you think about the biological component, like I just mentioned, then we're talking about millions of people's, their medical condition, what treatments are being provided, what drugs are being administered based on those different codes. So sitting somewhere in, in hackers, and they were attributed to a, a Chinese-based one, by the way, is that very, very valuable biological information. But that's the covert criminal access to data. But then, unfortunately, because we're not thinking about it this way, we're also giving it away. And the w one premise I want to leave with you all is that we are absolutely in the midst of a biological space race. And shame on us for not recognizing that. And, and it's appropriate that we're sitting here in DARPA to talk about this. And one element is that we haven't been provided the Sputnik wake-up call moment yet. But it's coming. I guarantee you it's coming. But the, the reason why I, I, this is so important is that if you look around, a lot of the genetic testing companies and services that are out there are all offshore. So just out of a quick, quick uh, survey, how many people here live in, from California, just out of curiosity? So uh, quite a few here. So here's what I mean by there's a disconnect here, that there is an overseas firm. They are HIPAA compliant. They meet all the existing privacy regulations. If you live in California now, the state is looking at offshoring uh, patient clinical genetic testing. So you might be in California, you go into a hospital, you're seeking medical care, you sign a HIPAA consent privacy form, but unbeknownst to you, your clinical sample is getting sent off to China for processing and for uh, the sequencing. So there's a disconnect between privacy and national security. And so what this does, though, it means that where's the data going? When you sign up for these companies in the, in the direct-to-consumer, like, I want to find out what percentage of ethnicity I am or things of that nature, 
We're so focused on privacy, but do you know who you're sending the data to? Do you know what they're going to do with the data? Who has access to that many data? Many people may not even think about that. They they're not. Say, oh, I want to know the answer, right? To, right. To that. And, and how many foreign investors are in there? So my concern is that because of our lack of understanding and, and, and expanding the, the, the scope of what constitutes a biological threat issue, is that are we suddenly short shrifting our future? Um, are we losing potential market share in the future health innovation space that's direly needed right now? So the nightmare scenario for me from a security standpoint is, and again, I don't mean to downplay it, but you, know, you have aspects of gene editing and, and, and uh, synthetic biology and engineering that's been talked about quite a bit, and DARPA has, BTO has quite a few programs that are attacking that, um, it, that aspect directly. That's great. But the nightmare scenario is not somebody out there engineering the zombie apocalypse causing virus, because that's what tends to be talked about. But the concern here is that because of our lack of understanding of where biotechnology is taking us, because of our lack of understanding of the true value of our data today, then I'm afraid that the US or maybe even our dependence on our future warfighters for, for countermeasures for, or for protection, we might suddenly find ourselves becoming healthcare crack addicts and we're dependent upon a foreign source for our future pharmaceuticals and healthcare. It's almost a low-level smolder that's happening, right? And it's one part technology, one part bioeconomy. Absolutely. And, and they're kind of feeding each other uh, while all of this is happening, right? And the true the ultimate challenge here is that if you think really carefully about what I'm talking about, there are elements of biological security, there are elements of cybersecurity that we're not thinking about because, yes, you may be protecting your financial and confidential data today, but your genetic information has some inherent value. But we're not thinking about if you're a victim of identity theft today or someone hacks into you, uh, your, your bank account and you lose it, yes, you might have some recourse, you can get some f funds back, you can change your PIN code, you can change your credit card information. But if your genetic code is sent to somewhere else, if your health insurance information or health records are sent somewhere else, once it's gone, it's gone. You can't do anything about it. So it, it does render security in a completely different light from a biological standpoint and something that we absolutely need to start thinking about and addressing today. Great, thank you so much, Ed. Thank really you. unique uh, perspective. So we're gonna shift gears here. So uh, Neil Hermiston's up next. So Navy SEAL, uh, you may not know this, Navy SEALs are often uh, the earliest adopters of, of DARPA kind of technologies and they're dealing with very real threats. So, so uh, Herma, uh, uh, what was your experience uh, along the way with biotech? We needed more of it. <laughs> right. I mean, my, my simplest answer, uh, I think we needed a lot more of it. Um, and if you'd like, I'd, I'd just like to kind of build some context here and get people uh, in, in a mindset. So I'm gonna ask everyone to use their imagination for about 30 seconds and kind of continue on to get this context to get a glimpse in the, in the life of operating as a Navy SEAL. So. This picture, you're in the back of an airplane getting ready to skydive into a mission. You're in the back of the airplane, you're looking out into the dark unknown. And you're really not worried about anything except you're executing your points of performance. Do your teammates checks, check your gear. You get out, try to do a perfect exit, perfect pull sequence. Make sure the chute's open, maybe little tugs to get some extra air in there. Okay, I'm not near anybody. I'm on my vector, start looking for people. Okay, people are checking in, I can see people, we're not going banging into anybody. We're on path, we got altitude, distance, we should be able to make our target. Turns, accountability, come in, land. Get out of your gear, make sure you have everything. Accountability, get ready to move out for your mission. And guess what, congratulations, you just inherited a chemical, chemical and biological weapons manufacturing target. And I, I would backtrack on this because the prep for this is, is pretty intense. Uh, you know, it's not just the anthrax shots and the boosters months beforehand and getting vaccines I've never even heard of but you have to get them before they expire. But then pre-op you're worried about, well, how, how many days ago did I shave because I'm, I don't want my skin exposed and I'm worried about how much hair is gonna protect the seal on my gas mask. Uh, and those are things that just go through your mind, again, well before you're going to the target. And 
Yeah, then, Herm, yeah. you're, you're jumping out of an airplane yeah. here, going into this unknown, but the bad guys could be there with something that you've never seen yeah. before, never dealt with. It yeah. could be any number Absolutely. of things, right? A, a number of things. You have a pill pack, and it's like, well, I was like, do we eat the pills before we put the masks on? Because it's kind of kind of moot point if, if it's after the fact. And yeah, you're absolutely going into the unknown on this. Um, you have to go in there, be surgical, and make great decisions. And you might ask, why are we going on these targets? Because the U.S. cannot just drop a bomb. We're responsible to ensure there's no dispersion and we're protecting everybody here. So we need people that can go on target and make those good decisions to ensure there's no dispersal. Um, but it's funny because like you're running up to target, having done this, and you're, just imagine like your gas mask just flushing in to your face, and as you get to the door, we're supposed to be super surgical before, who knows what's behind it, we're not really concerned about it, we're just trying to get there. You know, you're seeing the, the stars in the periphery because you're overworking your filters and your systems. And you know, it's just tough, and there's no way to get around it. We had blowers, we had all kinds of things, and then if you add um, self-contained uh, breathing apparatus, now what, I have an hour now, so when do I want to use that hour of, 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 of fresh air? Um, so I, I think that's it's very tough, um, and I, what I see on that is, you know, let's get beyond this World War One modification of equipment and protective gear, and I think we need to start looking internal. Because for me, I want to know I'm protected from the inside out, and that's how I kind of look at what we need to do and focus on on the uh, on, in the chem bio spectrum of targeting. And then you don't get to choose. Uh, where your missions are or what you do. So you go in these very hostile, desolate, and unsupported environments, like somewhere like Somalia, where if you look at that top left picture, that's kind of the norm. Um, but, you know, sometimes you're invited there, usually we're not. So that adds a little more local distrust and, and further complexity. And, and the thing is, everything's based on your decision. When you make a good decision, yeah, awesome, that's your job, that's what we expected you to do, but when you make a bad decision, it, it's catastrophic, and, and it gets pretty dynamic pretty fast. And so you have a lot of things going on that you're trying to take care of, and then like, oh, by the way, uh, we're in Africa, there's infectious disease, and you know, break out, or, you know, breakouts and all kinds of things, and, and yeah, my little bag with my couple packs of pills are awesome, but again, this is another area where I look at like, we need to go internal at that cellular, molecular level, and let, I need to, I like to know I'm protected, and that, that makes me more effective to, to deal with this uh, environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think other things we look at in these environments, so, you know, let's look at Somalia a lot longer than you'd think. So basically the, the current methods are have a good medic, bring good medicine, and, and have a really good trauma kit. Um, because if you look at Somalia, it's like almost the length of the eastern seaboard, but you look at the United States, you're always within an hour of quality medical care. Somalia, you got what you bring. And that's kind of a big deal because now you're looking at three hours away from quality medical care. If you get sick or injured, it's three it, hours it's if over. you can maybe find something. Right? That's if, if you have an airplane with you. Yeah. If you don't, you're looking at a six hour turnaround. And you know, on top of that, it's like in trauma, if someone was wounded, you know, the rule of thumb is you need an hour to get to quality medical care, so how do we extend that? Mm -hmm. right? And then I look at even a simple thing, we had one of our teammates get sick, and you know, the medic's like, I think he's got meningitis, and I'm like, you, you're kidding me, right? And he's like, no, I, I, I just don't understand what it is. I'm like, oh, well, obviously we gotta get him out of here. So that's all our efforts, getting one of our, our guys medevaced out. Turns out they get him to a medical facility, and he had malaria, but we hadn't been to the coast in like a month and everyone was taking their malaria pills because who wants to get sick? And like, was it a different strand? Who, who knows? But it wasn't that the individuals affected, the teams affected, but not only that, operations were shut down for like five days. So there, those are like some of the impacts. And again, when I look at like, hey, can we have a more robust immune system at that, uh, that cellular molecular so We need level? a leap. We, we need a leap. We, in, we need a big in, jump because in how we do this, right? Because hey, people have been taking pills for malaria since they, since they started taking them. You know, like I, I just hear Vietnam stories were were big, but you know we're seeing it here as well, and and I think it's just antiquated. Yeah. Um, and if you look at 
you know, we look at the, the SEAL teams were built to go do anything, anywhere, at any time. And the expectation is that you're always gonna be successful no matter what environment you're thrown in in the mission. And I think we train, you know, cross environment, cold, hot, jungle, desert, undersea, high altitudes, but you're never gonna be immediately acclimated to wherever you're called to go. And it, it really doesn't matter because our focus is, yeah, that's great, just make the right decisions, execute the mission, because you're trusted to be flawless in your decision making because the results are life and death. And you know, when we look at that, that, that puts a high demand signal, like where can I find more people like that? And like our current methods are World War II methods of some tests and- Paper tests, and, right? And, and subjective interviews. <laughs> so, and when I bring that up, I'm not, I'm not talking this Hollywood super soldier stuff that you see on TV. I mean, if you look at what SEALs, Green Berets, Special Forces operators do, we're already there. We have super soldiers, um, but we just need to quit piling gear up on top of them. Right? And, and that's how, that's do how it you, seems. How uh, do you bring the best out of the person from, their, from the physiologic perspective? You've been saying kind of look from inside to out. Yes. And, and maybe that's where the opportunity space is, right? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I, I just look at that next level, that next leap. I mean, if we look at what we're trying to do and what DARPA's mission is, is prevent and create surprise for our adversaries. I, I really think we do that at the, the maintenance, the care, and the protection of our military soldiers. I, again, I, I gotta reiterate, it's gotta be at that molecular and cellular level to go from the inside out to make us more effective because adding more gear and, and complexity just isn't cutting it. I think it actually simplify what we're doing a little bit. Okay, thanks so much, Hearn. It's all good. All right, Richard. Nicely done. So Richard, uh, I've heard some great stories when you were in the Pentagon and how you were bringing the perspective of biology to the Pentagon. So we'd love to, to hear your perspective on biotech uh, and how it's made its way through the years. Well, Justin, uh, the, uh, my colleagues on this panel began by thanking you, I think quite sincerely. My, my thought was to begin by expressing my resentment. Uh, <laughs> you give this terrific yeah. presentation. You have three people from the front lines of using biology in ways that really improve humanity. And why am I here? I'm to present the Pentagon policymaker view. Uh, <laughs> but in the course of your terrific presentation, um, I, suddenly the light went on for me. And it was when you described how submariners might extract information about their environment from shrimp noise. And I thought, now I get it. Justin's in the office, he's talking about boasting. I can even get noise from shrimp. And then he says, I got it for a panel, I'll invite Danzig. <laughs> uh, see what I can offer here. Um, I do though want to present uh, a different perspective and particularly uh, to suggest to you in the audience that there are special challenges associated with bringing biology to the national security world that I think uh, you need to be attentive to and shape both the magnitude of the challenge and, and its nature. Um, one aspect, I'll just make three points in this regard. One aspect of it is uh, something that I think has been touched on by uh, a number of comments, uh, commentaries in the course of these days, and that is true for a number of different technologies which is this uh, shift from Pentagon control to the outside world, uh, and biology clearly manifests it. Nicholas Negroponte in his book, uh, The Digital Age, published in the 1990s, had a nice metaphor for this. He said that photographers in the 19th century, when they wanted to invent new technologies when they needed them, they invented them themselves. They created new film, they created new lenses, new methods of development. And he says in the 20th century, if you look at the history of television, nobody thinks that actors invented television. The technology came from the outside and the actors had to respond to it. And in many respects, I think the military world with respect to the technological revolution and many of the technologies that we're talking about here is not controlling the technology evolution. It is emanating from outside and the challenges are dominantly 
challenges of assimilation. That's a general proposition, may not be true, obviously, for hypersonic missiles and some other things, but we're seeing it more and more, for example, with artificial intelligence, cyber, and the biology, certainly. But then second, there is a particular problem with the biology, an astute uh, historian uh, observed that you can look on the um, history of World War I as the history of the evolution of a connection between chemistry and DOD. And you can look at World War II as the coming of age of the appreciation of physics. And you can look at the Cold War as a time of the assimilation of technology and computer sciences and what we broadly might call IT and C4 kinds of, uh, kinds of issues. Um, the biologists have never come in historically. We haven't had that. And this was compounded by the, I think, good decision by President Nixon to decry, to abandon to, uh, the offensive biological program. So we now have a world in which we don't have offensive knowledge. And when that offensive knowledge is diminished, um, it undercuts your abilities to do defense and to assimilate the technology generally. So a general phenomenon that we're all now in this modern age, not photographers inventing stealth and GPS and the like, we are in fact television actors having to adapt. That is a particularly challenging and difficult thing for biology. And the third problem, I think, is that um, we don't have a naturally well-situated set of actors inside the warfare communities who uh, have an awareness of the potential that Justin so well laid out, who have an awareness of the kinds of issues that the panelists have commented on. We have some people like Neil, but in general, we don't have a cadre defined that has claims on resources, that influences strategy and the like. If you look at the history of our assimilation of digital things, for example, uh, digital ideas, you see how, for example, the military services built from their cryptologists who had digital knowledge, and slowly they became more and more central as this field of uh, computer-related cyber issues became more and more central. And slowly, over the course of two decades, the military appreciation of this expanded through those communities, and they became more and more accepted as ultimately a warfare community. In the biology area, we have a large number of doctors, but they're not regarded typically in the same way as war fighters. And uh, their concerns are dominantly strongly the concerns of healthcare. And that is one segment of what uh, uh, Justin talked about and what Nahid is uh, emphasizing. Uh, but there are other segments, the idea of, for example, sensors, the idea of biological enhancement of robotics. We're now, for example, looking at opportunities to meld muscle onto mechanical systems, organic muscle. Uh, we have all kinds of opportunities in terms of bioengineering, enhancement of the soldier and the like. And we don't have a natural constituency that powerfully may absorb this. So this will compound the difficulties that we've had. Enter DARPA. Uh, up until the 1990s, DARPA basically didn't do biology. And it was a big achievement, I think, that DSO, the Defense Science Office, began to get into this and we reaped the rewards of that when the anthrax occur attacks occurred in 2001, and the FBI, as Ed well knows, was central to responding, but it was DARPA that had much of the knowledge about how to do decontamination and the like. We are going to face similar kinds of issues in the time ahead. As Justin emphasized, the, uh, the creation of BTO moved us along within DARPA in ways that give us a greater concentration. But along with the national labs, you really are the only collection of people who are going to be substantially shaping the assimilation of this powerful new technology. And if, as Ed said, the 21st century is a biological century, very plausibly, in all kinds of dimensions, you need to be the gateway to that. And that's a huge challenge. It's a challenge not just of innovation, 
It's a challenge of assimilation from the outside world and what has always been particularly difficult for DARPA of encouraging development and assimilation within the services. You're a bridge of a kind that is especially important, but I think especially challenging. So I want to bring this environmental information, if you will, this situational awareness to you and encourage you particularly to embrace it. Uh, really, our national security future depends in substantial measure on how well you handle this task. Thank you. So uh, we're at the segment, the part of the, the segment where we're going to have some questions. So I know questions are coming in right now. So we, we got just a couple of minutes uh, to, to have this discussion. Let me just kind of lead off with one. So we heard a, heard a lot of topics today, but uh, DARPA is a very action-oriented uh, organization. We've got a great uh, community of people here where we can try to uh, lay some steps for some action. So let's kind of go down the line. If you can kind of take one action today that will make a difference in our uh, future, uh, what would it be? So anything come to the top of your list? So I, I mean, I sort of help highlight some of this stuff, but I'm going back to the DRC Uganda border in two yeah. and a half weeks. So you guys have yeah, two and a half weeks to innovate, by right. the way, and technology. <laughs> Um, anything. What would it be? I, I, I think it would be better protection of healthcare workers, however you want to interpret that. As, as Neil said, I'd like to be protected, I, even though I may appear cavalier in my career choices. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Ed, over to you. So if I can um, recommend maybe taking a riff off of iGEM. Okay. iGEM is really unique because those teams of students, it's not just all bio students, but you have bio students with coders, with, with phys physics students, with... It's, it's uh, cross-disciplinary, mm -hmm. so... My, my encouragement is that DARPA has it all under one roof, and much like the, the life sciences, it's going to be this, the, the revolution of the 21st century, let's, uh, let's tackle this in a multidisciplinary approach as well, too, and DARPA has all the capabilities of doing so. Okay, and let's figure out a way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Herm, one thing. <sighs> I know you have a long list. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a laundry list. I, I really just want, I, I, again, that the frontier is internal. I, I want people to go internal. I, I really want to dig deeper. Again, at that, that I think that, that cellular molecular level to, to protect the force. I mean, I think that robustness is, is key for okay. us to do. Scientists in the room, cell, cell molecular scale, uh, helping uh, our war fighters. Yeah. Okay, Richard. I'd like to see a demonstration, a proof of concept of one area in the biological sciences that is not oriented to the medical or towards human enhancement uh, or bioterror weapons, but is a demonstration of the ability to use bioengineering to develop something squarely relevant to traditional warfighter domains. Sensor might be an example. Body armor or other kinds of protection might be an example. Great. Uh, all right, so this is a question came through the interwebs here. So. Uh, this is an interesting one because I would love for this uh, team to unpack it. So how does the spread of CRISPR, okay, CRISPR is a gene editing technology, uh, pose a threat or benefit to society? How can we mitigate risks uh, from uh, malicious use of biotech? All right, there's a few angles on this one. Anybody want to take a first shot at it? Go ahead. Yeah. So that's one of our primary game plans is that um, the other thing I didn't mention about the WD Directorate is we do a lot of outreach and engagement. The, the thing about biotech is that it is, as I said, moving so rapidly, you have students and biohackers attending this. There's no way of regulating it from the top down. So what the FBI has been doing for several years now is actually reaching out to the communities mm -hmm. and enlisting their support, raising their awareness and empowering them to understand that there are these powerful tools. Um, the best way of putting it succinctly is that we are one of the sponsors of iGEM. So we actually provide workshops for students from all over the, that come from all over the world called Safeguarding Science in the Future. And the best way of putting it is that I, I invoke Spider-Man, that with great power comes great responsibility. And boy, do the students take to that. But it's imparting that kind of knowledge to the, the practitioners that deal with things like CRISPR because the students are using them, um, as well as the biohacker community. But how powerful is that if you have an entity like the FBI working in partnership with them to ensure, to be on the lookout, that in a sense we're, we're developing a network of sentinels out there to be on the lookout for malicious activity. Because it's, otherwise, until we get those sensors, like you mentioned, the best way of, of coping with this is let's get at the experts themselves, wherever they may be. Yeah, Richard, you want to get yeah. in on this? If I could, yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. You. I, I just, uh, 
It's so hard to maintain your balance as change like this comes so rapidly. CRISPR comes faster than the most sophisticated biologists ever expected an editing technique to arrive on the scene. Uh, and the inclination is to think about the dramatic consequences. It's important to pause and notice that there are a number of problems. You can't just edit and generate some superhuman or some weapon that uh, is going to wipe out certain races and not others. Uh, there are all kinds of problems in maintaining viability, et cetera, controlling your, your techniques. But having said that, you also have to recognize that as exponential change like Moore's Law takes hold in areas like biology, and it is, then uh, the changes come rapidly and flooding. And you have to recognize that that will produce great unevenness in our defenses as well as our offenses, demand new norms and the like. One of the big challenges of CRISPR is that people with different ethical preferences, different degrees of care in using it, will have different kinds of successes with different consequences. Mm -hmm. I would just add that one of the valuable things that's being done is being done now in BTO, which is safe gene. Yeah program that says, look, if we do experiment with CRISPR and the like, how do we assure that if it escapes into the wild, we can give it an effect a termination date or find methods of limiting it? That's an example of a very useful product I think you're, you're pursuing. I'm going to underscore that because, you know, the promise of CRISPR for infectious diseases in particular is huge, huge right? And I actually have a, in my grad school class, I have a case study exactly on this. So we now have the power. Mosquitoes are the number one killers of humans, correct? Right. Mosquito-borne infections. Um, we have the power potentially to alter so that mosquitoes can no longer replicate and, and just sort of make this sudden change where you no longer have a world affected by malaria and other, other dengue and other things. But what's the downstream impact of that, right? And, who makes and who the gets decision? The, yeah, the decision. Who gets to make that a decision? That is the key point. Who does the analysis? And I think similar to what you said, Richard, I think this pause of what, every, what we've done at every step of the technological innovation, whether it be recombinant DNA use, dual use research, thinking about who makes those ethical decisions and the downstream effects of it at a population level, which is what we're really looking at, some of the infectious diseases utilities at, um, is, a, is a powerful one. Yeah. And if I may just yeah, riff on that more, one, one question. So the, the CRISPR question always comes up, but there's one thing I want to, and it kind of goes back to my presentation, is that if you note, look at the scientific literature, as powerful and as useful as CRISPR is, it still has some quirks to it, well, um, so off target, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but at the end of the day, what does it boil down to is to the lack of data. Yeah. That if you want more fidelity in what you're editing, you need more genetic data, at, almost at a population scale. So yes, CRISPR is a powerful tool, but for me, at the end of the day, it's just a tool. What it actually does is it incentivizes accessing more genetic data. So again, it goes back to what I just said before. Suddenly, the data becomes really important. Data is a new oil for a lot of these type of applications to be built upon. Mm -hmm. But again, we're not thinking about that data and how we are securing it and using it in a, in a, in a safeguarded manner. Okay. Uh, so for our next question, I want to build up upon something Richard uh, had invoked here. So you were talking about Moore's Law and kind of the scaling of uh, electronics and things like that. So this is a neuro question. So uh, brain-machine interfaces are great for disabilities or disease cures, but how will this change human-machine teaming or human-machine interaction? Uh, any thoughts, uh, either Herm or, or Richard, on this one? <laughs> oh, well, uh, your, your predecessor, Jeff Ling, as uh, previous head today. of this office, right? <laughs> has a nice talk in which he observes how, uh, given Jeff, he probably has 20 nice talks, uh, how uh, it's not just that machines are turning, changing, we're going to change the nature of the human. And we already do this matter-of-factly with things like cochlear implants and so forth. Um, but uh, the capability to do more human engineering to cause us to mesh better with machines is, I think, a fundamental uh, evolution that we're going to see. And uh, we also are going to see extraordinary changes in the capabilities we have to pick our biological futures. Um, the fact that, for example, women can freeze eggs means that we could, they could plausibly have 10, 20, 30 children, 50 children in the time ahead by mechanisms of artificial insemination. The challenges to our notions of who we are are going to be fundamental both from the machines and from changes in ourselves in working with them. Yeah. 
Anybody else want a word on that one? That's good. No. Um, all right, one other question here. We're back to uh, vaccine. So uh, you can manufacture a vaccine treatment quick, quickly, but how do you ensure safety efficacy quickly? Uh, how do we work with others across the interagency? It could be the FDA or it could be IRBs in order to uh, uh, find new pathways uh, for uh, uh, clearance of these. Again, let me just frame this a little bit differently. These traditional uh, regulatory agencies, they kind of, uh, their pathways are, we have an indication, we have a therapeutic for that, and it's kind of a one-to-one -one match. But a lot of the things that we talked about today are more general purpose kinds of technologies that can be used in a variety of areas. So again, for anybody here that are working with these uh, organizations, any thoughts? Or I, I don't have a solution, but can I add another challenge to oh, that? Yeah, go for so, it. so Coalition uh, for Epidemiologic Preparedness Innovation, you might have heard of it, CEPI, is this new movement to try to get uh, vaccines out there for candidate emerging infectious diseases that are really going to be a big threat, right? So we have these now, but here's the, the thing. A lot of these diseases occur in areas with really poor research infrastructure. So how do you actually, and you have to wait until there's an outbreak, right, to really see if it's efficacious in humans. How do you do research in the middle of an outbreak and get efficacy information, even if you get to the point where you've solved all those challenges? So I'll just leave that yeah. there. Um, well, I'll put in a comment on this. So one of my dreams of, uh, you know, while my time is here at DARPA is, how do we work agency to agency, government agency to agency to set up these new pathways so that uh, we can get these technologies to people faster or more efficiently? And if you kind of couple that you know, government working well with innovative researchers who have new ideas for how to do that and we get that whole ecosystem working, I think we really can bring uh, some of these technologies uh, really to the table, okay? Um, so with that being said, I think uh, we're about out of questions. Let me just uh, thank the panel one more time. It was extraordinary having you uh, as a part of our, our team here.